attention that this is being recorded by Acton TV. Anyone else who wishes to record it is supposed to make themselves known to the chair now. With that done, we'll move on to the first item agenda, agenda item, which is public participation. If there's anybody who wishes to address the committee, please do so. Brief as usual. Uh, we'll move right along to the Kelly's Corner presentation. Mr. Mangiari. Good evening. I'm John Mangiarati, town manager. Um, and thank you for putting time on your agenda to discuss the Kelly's Corner infrastructure project. Um, as, you, as we talked about on Budget Saturday, we, uh, in the town manager's recommended budget, which will be considered by the Board of Selectmen uh, a, a week from uh, Monday, or actually this coming Monday, uh, we're recommending that $525,000 be appropriated from free cash uh, for this next part of the Kelly's Corner infrastructure project. Uh, the Kelly's Corner Infrastructure Project has been the, is the number one goal of the Board of Selectmen. And uh, since I've started here in the last uh, six or seven months, uh, it's been a number one uh, priority for uh, my team uh, here in Town Hall. Uh, with us tonight, we have uh, some of the members of our working group that have been working very hard on this issue. Roland Bottle, the Planning Director, Cora York, Public Works Director, Chris Sammet, a Captain with the Fire Department, Chris Priel, a detective with the police department, and Kristen Guichard, who I'd like to introduce uh, to have come up and give a presentation to go over uh, the project as it is today, and hope it answers some of the questions that you have about it, and we look forward to the conversation. So thanks for your time. I, Kristen actually is going to walk around, if that's all right. Thank you, John. Yeah, I can point a little bit more easily this way. Um, and uh, Chris is going to join me in the presentation. So thank you again for having us on your agenda tonight. Um, I'm going to ask that questions be held to the end of the presentation. And we'll try to answer everything tonight. And if we can't get to a question or um, we don't have the answer for you, we will make sure to get back to you. So we're looking right now on an aerial photograph of Kelly's Corner top down. So in this quadrant over here, you can see that's the Bola Drome over here. The Kmart building is over here on the left. The Acton Box Pearl School campus is up on the top left. Roach Brothers and that whole plaza is over here. The new CVS building is down here. The Hosmer House is over here, the Historical Society property. And the Route 2 interchange off of Main Street is here. And the Route 2 interchange off of Mass Ave is over here. The Kelly's Corner infrastructure improvements and streetscape improvements extend on Massachusetts Avenue, which runs west to east, all the way to where the Acton Real Estate Building used to be located. And the improvements extend on Main Street, right where the Acton Medical Building is in the Route 2 interchange, all the way down Main Street, just past the Learn and, Care, uh, Learn and Play Daycare. And they also are included um, on Community Lane, or formerly known as No Name Road, and Charter Road. So why Kelly's Corner? Why now? Many of you have been in town for quite a long time, and you've probably heard of several different concept plans that have been tried since the 1970s, really. Kelly's Corner has been an area in need of, of improvement identified by the town since that time. And this particular plan that we have now is the first plan that is addressing the needs of all users in Kelly's Corner. This is a complete streets plan, which means a street for everyone, bike lanes, accessible sidewalks, and improved vehicular travel lanes. This is the first plan that is really addressing all of that comprehensively. It's increasing safety and accessibility for all users, and is also addressing stormwater management. In addition to that, we're addressing the issue of vehicular congestion in Kelly's Corner, which I'm sure a lot of you experience either commuting or just trying to access some of the businesses there today. There are also issues out in Kelly's Corner that are just general maintenance issues and repairs that this project will fund and actually fix through funding through federal and state funds. Um, and there are businesses out there today that are going to benefit from these improvements. And this is the first time that we have a plan in town for Kelly's Corner that we've been able to solidify construction funding and leverage $14.5 million from state and federal funds. 
As John mentioned, and you probably remember the slide from Budget Saturday, there are two items in the town manager's proposed budget that include, um, re that are related to Kelly's Corner, totaling $525,000. Of that, $75,000 is associated with appraisal service costs, and $450,000 is associated with supplemental engineering design funds. So in 2016, at the annual town meeting, $756,000 was appropriated to fund a concept design, or to, to fund the engineering of a concept design that was defined at that time. Of that, a little over $44,000 have been spent to date. And we have a little over $311,000 remaining in the budget. There are two primary reasons why we need additional design funds. Now, this is a community-driven design. It's not a design that MassDOT has told us we have to do. It's a design that the community has defined. Since 2016, as the design plan has advanced, and those design plans were shared with the public at several outreach meetings, workshops, and different sessions with property owners, there have been issues that have been defined by the public and concerns about safety. This, this number here, the $122,000, is associated with an increase in the design scope to include the signalization of Charter Road and Massachusetts Avenue, as well as the signali signalization of Community Lane and Massachusetts Avenue, and realigning Charter Road at Mass Ave. So those were safety concerns that were expressed by the residents at these outreach meetings, as well as the Acton Police Department and the Acton Boxborough School District. In addition to that, the other major reason is because there were concerns expressed by private property owners along the project area about the impact of the project to their property. And that's totaling $132,000. In total, the design, engineering design cost will be costing the town a little over $1.2 million, including the original appropriation from um, 2016 and then the additional $450,000 that is being asked for. So again, this project is leveraging $14.5 million in construction funds, but there are other funds that the state also has to pay for. This is breaking down what the town share is projected to cost and what the state and federal investment is projected to cost. So there was another appropriation back in 2013 annual town meeting. That was for the initial concept planning, um, and then the additional 756,000, and then the 450 that's being asked for today. The state does not pay for design costs. The town is also responsible for the right-of-way real estate appraisal services um, and the acquisition costs for any properties or slivers along Massachusetts Avenue, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me, along Main Street and Community Lane. So this image here is showing the right-of-way responsibility of the town versus the right-of-way responsibility of the state. So the town is responsible for the right-of-way and appraisal service process and acquisition costs for everything shown in red, and the state will be responsible for the appraisal process and acquisitions on anything shown in yellow. So you can see that um, the state is actually covering more than just what they own. They also include K the, in front of the Kmart property because they have to take this area here, um, that strip in front, um, they'll also cover the rest of the property that's needed. The state, again, will be covering the $14.5 million in construction funds, and then the town is responsible for any non-participating items. Um, so the state essentially will not pay for ornamental lighting. They'll light the roadway, but they won't do um, ornamental lighting, and that's up to the town to decide whether or not they want to pay those funds um, and implement that aspect of the design. So not only are we leveraging $14.5 million, but we are also addressing uh, maintenance and repair issues that are out there today or that would be 
would be um, fixed in the next 10 years. So that includes drainage and stormwater management, sidewalks that need to be updated for accessibility standards, and implementing Acton's bike lane plan. So Acton has, um, has adopted the complete streets policy, has identified top priority locations for bike lanes. Kelly's Corner is one of them. So this is another item that would be implemented by the town regardless of this project. This is an image of what Main Street heading south looks like today. The Hosmer House, the Historical Society property is over here on the right, and Not Your Average Doze is over on the left. The infrastructure and streetscape improvements include street trees on both sides of the street on, throughout the entire project area, designated left turn pockets for better business access, so oftentimes People are waiting for that one person to turn left into Sorrento's to grab a pizza, and it's just backing up the traffic the entire way on Main Street. This allows for that car to get out of the queue and allow for the other traffic to move through. It's also safer for pedestrians because you know exactly where that car is going to turn and when. There are raised landscaped islands proposed at each approach into Kelly's Corner, as well as two pedestrian refuge islands. That's what this is being, uh, this is shown here. And pedestrian rapid flashing beacons. Those are the crossings that you see at the, um, the new bike lane, uh, the bike trail coming through. And out front here. Mm -hmm. um, and pedestrian amenities, designated bike lanes throughout Kelly's Corner on both sides of the street, and accessible sidewalks. We're now looking at the primary intersection. So the Snoco gas stations over here, Buena Isano, the Verizon building, this is Massachusetts Avenue, and Main Street. This is north-south. So today on Main Street, if you're heading south, there is a left, or I'm sorry, there is a left turn lane heading east towards Concord, and there is another lane over here that's a through and right turn lane, so it, it does both functions. With the proposed plan, there would be a designated right turn lane and a designated through lane. If you wanted to go left and head towards Concord, you would be directed to go down Community Lane, and at the end of Community Lane and Massachusetts Avenue, there would be a new signalized intersection that would allow you to safely turn left onto Mass Ave. Um, on Main Street heading north, today there is a designated left turn lane and there is this through right turn lane. The proposed plans add a new through lane heading north onto Main Street and you'll notice over here that there are two receiving lanes. So what this does is allow for two lanes of traffic to move through the intersection up onto Main Street further, allowing for more capacity and more volume to go through. And then if you wanted to turn right, this lane here is the lane you'd get into to turn right. Um, there is still a designated left turn lane on Main Street heading westbound. On Massachusetts Avenue today heading east, there is only one left turn lane, and then there is that through right turn lane. The proposed plans include adding this second left turn lane. And that second left turn lane significantly improves the actual um, movements and congestion on all of the different legs within this intersection. The roadway configuration on Massachusetts um, Avenue heading west remains the same for the vehicular um, movements. So there's that through right turn lane and a left turn lane. But you'll notice throughout this area, you'll see the bike lanes. There are street trees lining the street with a, a, with a buffer for the pedestrian, new sidewalks, and also crosswalks that are different. So today you'll notice that the crosswalks are pretty skewed. So we have our all-star team here helping us out to help orient you there. Um, and with the proposed plans, the crosswalks will be more perpendicularly aligned. The infrastructure improvements and streetscape improvements also include a pedestrian gathering node. That's this area here in red. So one of the 
concerns and um, visions that the community members and residents of Acton shared was to really create some type of public space in Kelly's Corner because we don't really own anything as a town except for the Acton Box Pro School campus that's there. There are a lot of students that gather at the corners um, and they're very narrow corners. So this particular location would look something like this that will be further defined as the um, landscape design elements are refined in the 75% design. More than one intersection is being improved through this project, so it's not just the primary intersection. This is the intersection of Community Lane, shown here, and Massachusetts Avenue, and the CVS driveway is down here. So that's the same thing shown over here. So Community Lane and Massachusetts Avenue. This is what we have today. There are no um, designated turn lanes here. It's kind of a free-for-all. There's a driveway curb cut very close to the intersection. And there are a lot of concerns expressed by residents about the safety of trying to get out of CVS and get out of Community Lane. The proposed plans include signalizing the intersection, adding new crosswalks where there are none today, and those crosswalks will be part of a, phased, um, a phase within the signal um, system. There will be a designated right turn lane, and then that, right, uh, that left and through lane towards the CVS driveway and the driveway access um, that was shown over here would be closed off. So this is what that will look like. There'll be street trees again on both sides of the street, sidewalks on both sides where there is no sidewalk on this portion today. We'll be reducing the number of driveways, not only here but throughout Kelly's Corner, so that it helps with access management and again for pedestrian safety. Bike lanes on both sides of Community Lane, the designated turn lanes, and the signalized intersection. Again, I'm, I wanted to mention this um, specifically because this is really an area of concern that residents have, have vocalized, and specifically um, for uh, another reason, too, that I want the Acton Police Department to talk a little bit about. We've had several. Oh. I'm sorry. We've had several accidents down in this intersection, as um, some of you have experienced trying to get out of CVS and and come across, um, there's really no um, real order on how to get across the road. We've had several accidents, even a rollover down in that area. And if you're a pedestrian, there's no way to cross the road down here. So with this project, it would put all that into perspective. It would give the motorist a safe way, a pedestrian the safe way, and once again, there's bike lanes throughout this area. So it's a hit for all three. Um, we feel for, uh, on the public safety side, this would be a very important, a very safe intersection through this plan. All right, and now we're gonna move on to Charter Road. Charter Road at Mass Ave, if you all know, this is the entrance to the Acton Box for Regional School Complex. Right now, there is no, there is one turn out and one way in. And with the new plan, there's gonna be signals out in the area, as you see, it's going to be signalized. There's going to be crossings, and there will be some designated turn lanes. So coming down from Boxborough, as you all know, in the morning, the traffic ties up really, really bad coming down. Right now, there will be a designated turn lane going in, a lane to go straight forward. And also coming out of the school, there will be a designated lane to turn right to go towards Boxborough, and a lane to go straight in the lane to go, um, excuse me, the lane can go straight or to take a left to go down to Kelly's Corner. As you see here, the alignment is going to be different. We're going to align um, Charter Road. Right now it looks like this. It's going to look like this afterwards. So they're gonna take this entrance for the Kmart parking lot and it's gonna be aligned up here. Uh, we're gonna move it, we're gonna move this over and align it down to that area. It's gonna make it a lot safer because right now this is what you're seeing. The crossing guard up here has to tend for this area in the afternoon when the buses are coming out, the children are crossing, and the only time the children can cross safely um, with a crossing guard there is for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon designated what time their schools are. Under the new plan, as we said before, there's gonna be crosswalks out here that will be controlled for the lights, so it will be a safe passage for the students at all time, make it less confusing for the, for the monitors 
that are out there now that may not have to be there because of the signalized um, lighting. The realignment will come into, into focus, as you can see right here. Um, west and eastbound, you've got um, one of those raised islands up here and the um, trees along the side. And those just aren't first um, looks. Studies have shown that the, ra the trees and the raised islands are a calming effect. They actually, studies have shown, they slow down the vehicular speed through the areas. So down on Mass Ave, they'll have it, those raised islands also um, down in the area of the old Acton Real Estate, and there'll be a crossing down there for people to cross over from the Victor School and that side of the road. So um, they do add um, big safety. This has been a concern for years from the school department and also a concern of us on the police department side of safety in this area, especially with the students crossing and the traffic being so backed up um, at certain points of day. It's a uh, huge concern, a matter of safety. So as we said, this landscape buffer with streets, trees on both sides. We have new sidewalks on both sides. Right now, the sidewalk ends way back here and um, you only have to go on this side the sidewalks the sidewalks also are all going to be at street level so if you're coming up the hill right now from um, with the Levine law offices way down here coming up the hill on Mass Ave where the ball field is for the Marion building you see the sidewalk sloping up that's all going to be down on street level so it's going to really add for the convenience of somebody that's uh, needs the assistance for the compliance of ADA. They can, they can handle their chair or um, getting up that hill a heck of a lot easier. There's going to be some street lighting up here also. Um, and as we said before, Kristen said, this plan really hits everybody. It, it's, um, once again, it hits the bicyclists because we have bicycle lanes throughout. It's safe for the motorists because if you've ever driven on Main Street in your car and a bicyclist, you're, you're grabbing that wheel, trying to decide, well, is it my lane? Is it his lane? Whose lane is it? It's going to define it. It's going to be safer for you driving your car, the guy in the bicycle, your child crossing the street down here, or your neighbor's kid. And as a parent, you're going to feel a lot safer sending your kid down the Kelly's Corner or through this area. And it's also going to be for people um, with disabilities, it's going to make it a lot easier. These lights are going to all be have an audible tone for this um, cross going across the crossings. It will make it a lot easier for everybody to see and hear. It's a lot safer. So with that, also, that's one more thing, I'm sorry, the shuttle stop. There's going to be a shuttle stop up there. Um, as the school department went through a few years ago, the bus passing system, uh, the buses don't uh, bring their kids in the afternoon to a place unless it's a designated daycare in the afternoon. The shuttle will have a place to pull over, pick up the, the students that they want to go somewhere. So it's just going to be like a community bus stop right there. Make it a lot easier and more convenient for the shuttle service and for the community at large. So with that, I thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Kristen. So right now, we are at the 25% design stage. We have finalized our review with MassDOT, and they have supported the changes that we have made. Um, we are scheduled with MassDOT to have the 25% design public hearing in this room on March 5th, coming up very soon. Following that, at April Town Meeting, are the two items that are proposed in the Town Manager's budget, um, those two items relating to Kelly's Corner, the design services and appraisal services. And then in 2020, we would come back to the town because we would need two additional um, votes at Town Meeting. One would be to authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire property for this project, um, whether it be um, fee simple or through easements and even temporary easements that are for a day for construction um, and to uh, um, for the acquisition funds to pay those landowners for those acquisitions. Um, MassDOT already has a scheduled date to advertise this project out for a bid. So um, I highly doubt it will be on December 25th, but that's what's in their project schedule, so it will probably be the day before or day after, most likely. Um, but it's, it's, in, it's in their calendar, um, so we need to stick to that date. Um, it's very important that we do that. 
Um, and then we are on the Transportation Improvement Program with the Boston Metropolitan Planning Organization for construction funding to commence in federal fiscal year 2022. And again, $14.5 million is programmed and ready for that time period. There's some project highlights and um, data and numbers. Um, so 2.24 miles of new accessible sidewalks, 157 new street trees that will be uniform and planted in appropriate places um, and appropriate species, five new crosswalks where they do not exist today. There will be four pedestrian rapid flashing beacons and increased mobility and accessibility throughout the area, um, as well as two new traffic signals that we discussed, 73% um, reduction in CO emissions, and that really relates to the reduction in queues and reduction in cars idling sitting there waiting at the lights. Um, and there are four major intersection redesigns for increased safety, and again, the $14.5 million um, of investment from the state and federal government. And questions? We'll probably go around the table and give everyone a chance. Tom, do you want to start, or Sahana, do you want to start? Which end do you want to start on? We'll start over there. Sahana. Kristen and Chris, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. It was perfect, and um, it's pretty clear of uh, what we're expecting at um, Kelly's Corner, and thank you for that, for all the work that you've put in. Is that a question? <laughs> oh, let's just ask these questions, and anybody that can answer them, <laughs> do so. Uh, how did we estimate the land taking cost? So the estimate for the land taking costs, again, it is a ballpark estimate. So please remember that. Um, we were asked to provide an estimate, um, and so, so we did the best that we could. Um, again, I want to make sure everyone understands the process. So this is a federally funded pro project for construction, so we have to follow the federal guidelines for acquisition of property. We cannot have the properties appraised until we receive our right-of-way authorization, and that doesn't happen until we're about at the 75% design plan. So what we have done to come up with an estimate for you tonight is we took um, the appraisal value that was done recently for the Kmart property and we looked at what the square footage, the price per square foot was, and we associated that dollar amount to the proposed um, land acquisitions, both for the, the again, the, the fee simple takings, those strips of land that we have to purchase outright for temporary construction easements and for permanent easements. And that's assuming, again, there's a lot of assumptions in there that all of those would be valued at the same amount. Um, so that is what we did to provide the best estimate that we could at this time. So it could be more, it could be less. Um, we have to and we are um, obligated to give property owners fair and just compensation. They are entitled to that, but they can offer to donate their easement um, or their fee, um, fee taking. Um, it's up to them. But that could happen as well. Do we anticipate any issues with the landowners, as was evidenced last year at town meeting? So that's that's a great question, and um, I think it's really important to talk about that because the plans that we have today incorporate um, design changes, and some of the funding changes uh, funding request is associated with that. So you'll notice um, I'm going to bring this slide up here. This is the primary intersection. The Bueno Isano restaurant is located here, the old Meineke building. Um, previously, the plan included um, removing more parking spaces than are, what are shown in this plan today, and the impacts were greater. We have worked with the design team since town meeting in 2018 um, to see if we could shift the roadway alignment, um, and we have um, asked MassDOT to take a look at a report that they, the design team actually completed the previous year. Um, and MassDOT has approved this particular alignment, which shifts Main Street away from that property and uh, allows us to minimize the impacts there. So today, they have 12 parking spaces. If you go out there, they have 12 parking spaces. Um, with this design plan, maintaining two ways in, so two way in and out of Main Street and two way in and out of Mass Ave, 
they can, we will be able to retain 10 of those 12 parking spaces. If they go down to a one-way in on, Ma on Main Street and one way out on Mass Ave, we can retain every single of those 12 parking spaces. We're just waiting for the property owners um, to um, decide or really get back to us on what they would prefer. And um, do we anticipate uh, any economic takings, the difference being we're putting somebody out of business? We don't anticipate that at this time, but again, the appraisal process has not commenced. Um, the proposals for um, acquisitions are strips along the roadway, um, but again, we, we can't anticipate that at this time. Well, the difficulty in this, Kristen, is of course, you want to to go ahead with this, but we're not really going to know how much the town has to pay until more than a year from now. So it's a, we need to pin down the, the numbers as best we can, which sounds like you've done a pretty decent job. I feel the estimate that we have is, you know, is the best that we can do at this time. So. Thank you. I want to echo, thank you uh, for the presentation. It's very informative. Um, you know, I was just curious how you thought about the Kmart property and how that could be utilized in the, you know, five, ten year sort of time frame. So the Kmart property is not um, any part of this proposal today. So this, this is not about zoning or anything like that. We're really just talking about the infrastructure improvements for the Main Street, Mass Ave, Community Lane, and that portion of Charter Road. So are you thinking about it just as a continuing retail establishment, um, some sort of shops or something like that? I mean, traffic-wise, as far as the impact of the center. Okay. So in terms of in terms of um, projected volumes and traffic, so the design engineers are required to look at traffic projections projections out to 2038. Um, and what this design plan does is takes a look at anything that could potentially happen in the future. And we've also asked them to take a look at future development. So we've looked at even behind the CVS property, there's a there's area there that could be um, developed in the future. So the design plan and all of the numbers and projections for um, queue lengths, level of service, wait times, that all is, is included with that. So if the Kmart property were to be redeveloped into something, the infrastructure project with the improvements can handle the, uh, the development. Gotcha. And then, you know, just sort of follow on to Steve's question is, um, you mentioned Bueno, but how are the other businesses, uh, what's been their receptivity to, to this design and this sort of plan? So we have been um, working with the property owners since 2015. Um, we have reached out to all of them and offered them um, meetings. There have been very few that haven't um, taken us up on that. Um, at this point, we feel that we have been able to address concerns, um, but we're still working with them um, and continually you know, maintaining contact and outreach um, so that if anything comes up, we can try to address it. Um, we have been able to address the issues at the Hosmer House or the Historical Society property, um, and they have just recently submitted letters of support for the current design. And then one more is, um, have you given any thought to, like, is there, is there any maintenance costs sort of an on, ongoing, you know, the properties, the raised sort of islands and everything else that goes along with it? I'm sure it's pretty standard to, to understand what those costs could be on a recurring basis. The DPW department feels that they will be maintaining this adequately within their budget, and the, um, the raised landscaped islands um, can actually be maintained through a new program that the DPW worked on. Um, I don't know, if Corey, if you want to talk about that a little bit, or maybe not, but, um, but basically it's an adopt, adopt an island or adopt a, a streetscape type of pro program. So we'll be working with the property owners in that area, probably the larger property owners, to see if they'd be interested in taking that on. Great, thanks. Um, can you go back to the community lane slide real quick? No, the other, the, so, you have an overview one, right? Yes. How do I get to Starbucks? 
So if you wanted to go to Starbucks, you would go in through Massachusetts Avenue through that. There's a driveway. They actually have three driveways into their property. So there's three access points to get to Starbucks today. So um, you would go in through Massachusetts Avenue. And then there'd still be the upper exit by the bank or just yes, the one? Yes, that would still be there. It would still be there. Yep, okay, so you're just there. getting rid of the first entrance on Community Lane. Correct. Which okay. would be a plus. It would add parking for them also. So. Right. Okay. Um, and then on the... Um, school the realignment of charter road um does that just go into kmart's parking lot does it become a roadway so the, oh sorry that does go into the kmart parking lot right now it's not a roadway that would be the entrance that is an entrance right now exit that comes out of there right Right. So it'll be more formalized and less just dumping into a parking lot. Exactly. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I want to compliment you guys for a great use of graphics. I think at town meeting, you, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And uh, you know, a lot of people have trouble comprehending numbers and charts and stuff, but that picture especially with the overlays and the graphics are <clears throat> really uh, sell your point. Um, and people need to visualize what it would actually look like, and this accomplishes that. I have a couple other questions. <clears throat> the left turn lane on Mass Ave and 27, um, and Mass Ave and um, 111, DOT has <clears throat> approved that, that you can no longer, you'll no longer be able to turn left? Correct. So Mass DOT has approved this design plan. That includes the raised traffic islands? Yes. Uh, the um, pedestrian gathering area, which is a cool idea, and it's something that <clears throat> actually years ago used to be over in front of the law office at least where people put their community notices, the, the high school plays and the political, well, the usually school related uh, or governmental related stuff. Will there be like a, a sign policy so that it's just not <clears throat> overwhelmed with sandwich boards that advertise this, that, and the other thing? I think it's something you need to think about. That's a very good recommendation. We'll definitely think about that. Um, Community Lane, is that the official name, or is that still just a, working, a work in progress? So, so I have <laughs> some ideas there. So, um, and, I, and I, I'm not sure if I, I probably didn't mention this. So if you're unaware, um, Community Lane is actually privately owned. That is owned by the property owners right. that own um, the, the Roach Brothers and Not Your Average Joe's property. Um, it was formerly known as No Name right. Road, but the property owners actually did a survey and process to, um, with the Acton residents, I guess, to, to define it. So it is formally Community Lane. Okay, because I was since it is provides access to the Hosmer House historic area, a name like Hosmer Abner Hosmer Way might be something worth considering. Um, also, the um, the traffic light on Charter Road after school hours, we're talking nine ten o'clock at night. Will they be just flashing yellow, or they will be continue to be red and green? They're, right now, they're proposed to be fully signalized, so they would not be flashing yellow. So it'll be a, a, a red light there, even at 10 o'clock at night when there's no school. Is that what? So the, the signalization of the entire area is, is basically all coordinated. So um, oftentimes, if you're, I mean, if you're driving out late at night, um, you'll notice that you don't typically get reds because there's there are sensors under the roadway, um, so the car, basically the the sensors pick up whether or not a car is there waiting. So um, that's that's how this will work yeah, as well. That's just a, and, and Mike, yeah, to, Mike, to that point, 227 years ago was a flashing at oh. night after hours, and the safety issues. I'm sorry, because of safety issues, Mass DOT changed that, so that does get signalized 24/7 now. So uh, I think it's, 
it's under the preview and it's the traffic study that DOT would do that would determine whether that would be um, continued or a flashing at times. Right. <clears throat> well, I think you guys have really made progress and uh, I think it's gonna fly. The other <clears throat> unrelated or sort of related to that is that the Kmart pro property, which you know we're not talking about tonight, I think once this infrastructure plan is in place, <clears throat> it'll make that property, property uh, you know, much more marketable and, you know, you're putting lipstick on the pig and uh, you're giving it the curb appeal because uh, the whole surrounding area will look so nice, uh, you know, somebody's going to want to put something nice there. I think Steve and Dave uh, and um, mostly Steve and Dave, I guess, fit the, the main questions that I had. Uh, one, I just want to make sure I understand the new signalization, though we're adding two sets of signals, one at Charter Road and 111, another one down at Community Correct. Right, and 111. We're still keeping the, the main one at the intersection. Correct, yes, and it will be updated. So it will be more efficient. Um, it will be phased with the other signals and it will also be improved for pedestrians. Okay, so I, I get that it is phased. I, I guess I'll believe it when I see it. it. It just seems like an awful lot of lights, but I'm not an expert on that. Otherwise, no, everyone has hit the questions I had. Uh, partially in response to Tom, I have spent a lot of time at both of those intersections and having lights there would be really helpful especially coming out of Charter Road. You can't well, see up over the hill. It's, disagree, yeah. uh, but it does seem like a lot of lights in a row. Um, I'm sorry, I was taking notes and wasn't paying as much attention to everything. I think you talked about there being costs that the town would have to incur if this project didn't happen relative to bike lanes. Yeah. Um, am I right in understanding these are things that we'd pay for regardless, that are covered in this project? Correct. So if we didn't do the project, we'd still have to pay? These are things that would be anticipated within the next 10 years that would have to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Um, Mike, can you put up the slide where you're looking south on Maine from Acton Medical? Is there, from, that is right there, back up. Right there. So you're going to have that. Is there going to be two lanes, two in each direction right there? Or is it one in each direction with that raised middle island? In this particular location, so if you are heading, um, you're coming off the route to ramp or out of Acton Medical, there is only going to be one lane heading south and one head lane heading north. Okay. Um, you will have this raised pedestrian landscaped island. Um, and then as you get beyond that, there will be that left turn lane for movements going left onto Community Lane. Okay, so where would the raised center island end? The raised center island ends about where... Um, community Lane enters? No, 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 be, be before that. Okay. Um, so the raised landscaped island ends before where Community Lane enters because there's that left turn lane that allows you to turn left into Community Lane. Yeah, okay, I get to see if there's an accident so. in that, where those islands are, car accident. That's somebody rear end somebody. Now traffic's going to be tied up because you can't get around it because those trees are in the middle. That's one. The other one is probably for Corey is how much more is that going to add to snow, snow removal? Like was this past weekend we had the big storm. You can't just run a plow down the center of the road either. It's, you have to be more delicate there because where are you, you going to push the snow one side or the other? It just kind of limits what can happen with the snow removal. I don't know if that's going to add any more expense overall because it's going to take more time to take care of that area. Uh, I mean, with the islands, there are things we'll be working around, similar to in West Acton Center, we're working around the bump outs there. Uh, it's kind of that balance between enhanced safety and um, sort of maintenance. It's In this case, they're not necessarily when you see in Windsor Ave, the bump outs where we're go, uh, West Acton, we were going around. These are sort of in the center so we can go through and then as a sidewalk plow comes through, they'll do their normal routes and have to just kind of cut through those refuge islands to open those up. So um, I don't see it as a, as a big increase. It's just, um, it'll be different. Take some time to get used to that. A vast improvement. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. 
And I just wanted to mention too, Roland, that the left turn lane um, that starts right after the raised landscaped island, um, there are specific standards that Mass DOT has for the length of that turn lane before an intersection. So um, your concern about the, the collisions, there are very specific standards um, that this design plan meets in order to avoid anything like that. Yeah, <clears throat> who was Kelly? <laughs> well, actually, um, my, to my knowledge, it was a family that owned the old law office um, on the corner. Is that about right? I think I believe they owned a farm, um, and there are some interesting stories that happened in that house. If uh, <laughs> you do a little bit more research, but um. we actually have a history project work that we're working on right now, and if you'd like to participate, we'd love your your help. Uh, because that is a question that we, we've, at, we've asked each other and we, we've been researching and uh, we've talked to a few people who have a lot of different uh, recollections of how that intersection became to be named. But uh, if you want to help out, we'd, we'd, love, we'd love another hand. Dave, if you had a follow-up? <clears throat> yeah, just real quick is, uh, and maybe, maybe this might be more for Corey, but is if you look at the scope of this project and all the work you're doing and you, you mentioned the repairs and maintenance of the road, I'm just curious if you have an estimate at what sort of costs are avoided by, that the state would be funding for by moving forward with the project. Like maybe it's a million dollars of repair and maintenance that act and doesn't have to pay because the state will pay it. Do you have any? Yeah, and that, um, that's kind of what, um, you know, we worked with, um, with Corey on this and um, what we were looking at um, is, you know, what would, what would have to be done or, or maintenance, or, you know, maintenance or repairs. Um, implementing the bike lanes, and we're looking at up to you know approximately two million dollars over like the next ten years to get some of these things done that the town would be oh, doing. Oh, that we would be spending. That we would be doing otherwise, right regardless of this okay, project. Got it. Okay, thank you, Steve. You have a follow up. Yeah, it's more of a request since uh, Mike uh, didn't make his usual request, and you are dealing with uh, traffic on Charter Road. Could we maybe find enough money to put a sign by his house at the far end of Charter Road that says this is not the AB campus? <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Um, your estimate of land taking costs you brought in at $1.5 million, uh, and I understand entirely that you said that this is a range. Does that is supposed to also include the full cost of the acquisition of all of Community Lane? Yes. Okay, why so cheap? That seems like a, a lot less than we've heard for any kind of square footage of taking over of new, of new roads. So what we did was we based, again, we based it off of a price per square foot. So the most recent and closest appraisal that had been done for a property near Kelly's Corner was the Kmart property. Um, and so we took that land value and associated it with the preliminary right-of-way plans, which delineate all of the total areas of strips of land, or in this case, the all of community lane, and multiplied, essentially, to get what that number would be. But this is a different thing. This is not this is not taking a small sliver of land off of someone's property that's taking over an entire road, which is, I've been told in the past, is exceedingly expensive. So I'm, I'm surprised at that number. So I just want to say I'm definitely surprised that, and also when you talk about that total number, you're, you're counting everything that was, I believe it was in yellow, which was the state's responsibility. You're not, you're not, uh, you're not incurring any costs on any of that at all. Correct? So everything shown, again, in yellow is the state's responsibility. So there will so, be land taking, so Jewel will just not come out of the town pocket. It will come out of the state pocket. Right, and we're estimating the state's portion to cost them about $1.9 million. Okay. Um, are there any chances that any of this work that you do is going to have to get redone as a result of a development plan on the large Kmart parcel, which is the most likely parcel to be redeveloped in the next five to 10 years. And is there any way to statutorily block that out so that we are not on the hook for having dug up this whole area, mm -hmm. get a couple years out of it, and then have to dig it up again to please the developer? Yeah. So this is, again, a community-driven project and defined by the Acton residents. So this project, 
is being also constructed with federal and state funds. The town dictates what the developer will do on our roadway and the state does as well. So this is setting the groundwork on what the town wants and if a developer comes in and redevelops the Kmart property, they have to basically listen to the town and, do, and, and abide by this layout plan. So by doing access management now, we're laying the groundwork of where it makes the most sense for safety and accessibility, um, as well as um, movement for vehicular um, uh, movements. And um, if, the, if a future developer um, wants to make a change, they would have to get approval from the town and the state because it's a state roadway, um, and they would be on the hook for those design changes and construction changes. To that end, are there any other curb cut changes other than losing the one at, by Starbucks, which I'm fine with losing, by the way? Uh, is there any other curb cut lessenings? I'm thinking about the Baker Whitney area. That that could, that whole thing should be able to be cut down into a lot fewer curb cuts. Yeah, actually, that is exactly one of them. So, let me. Grab this. There are a few throughout Kelly's Corner. So today, um, yeah, the Baker Whitney Oil site has quite a wide driveway and, and two. So that is going to be narrowed um, and consolidated. Um, the Kmart property has two driveways off of Main Street. They will be closed off and consolidated into one, um, more towards the center across from the Sorrento's um, uh, restaurant. The driveway access to the new Dunkin' Donuts. That's very, very close to the driveway access for the upper plaza here. That will be closed off, and the parking lot will be slightly altered to allow for the movement to that parking lot there. Um, the other driveway that will be consolidated, um, I think we, we spoke about this one here, um, where the Starbucks business is, I just wanna make sure I'm catching all of them. The fewer the better. Sunoco, thank you. Yeah, so the, the Sunoco station has two um, drivers or curb cuts right here off of Massachusetts Avenue. They will be consolidated in, into one, um, and I think. And the drive in that one up that's close it. to Kelly's Corner, so you're not going to have that huge hill one. Right now, there's a huge hill one that's closer to Roach Brothers, and uh, we've experienced numerous trucks getting stuck on that hill. They're going to move that entrance to be closer to Kelly's Corner to lessen that, and it will be more of a safety factor because right now, if you're coming out of that one that's the, quite the large slope, it's almost a blind, um, blind look coming down. So once again, by uh, closing that one, it puts a lot more safety into perspective. But to Sunoco, you would still be able to get into the Sunoco from both directions, so to speak. You're not yes. not totally closing it off. Okay. Correct. There'll be one on, on Main Street and one on Mass Ave. Okay. So we're not going to have a problem with that property right. owner. Okay. Um, there had been conversation about flattening uh, Mass Ave closer to Kelly's Corner. Um, the whole conversation at the time was that you were going to move Charter Road farther to the west so that we would not have to do as much flattening but then you just said we were gonna be flattening the sidewalk. So are you just flattening the sidewalk aspect or are you flattening the entire road to, to create that better line of sight? And if you're flattening the entire road, why do we need to move charter uh, if that was the driving force behind moving charter uh, to begin with? So when, um after we had the several public outreach meetings and workshops, and that came out as a real top concern from the residents to um, really take a closer look at that intersection of Charter Road and Mass Ave, the design engineers had to look at a couple of alternatives. One alternative was bringing the crest of the road down. Um, that would have required a significant amount of roadway work because there are a lot of utilities under there. Um, they also look, took a look at signalizing the intersection. Both of those alternatives included realigning Charter Road. So I think, um, I think Christine, you mentioned that the sight lines coming out are, are horrible. Or, Christi or Kristen, I think you were talking about that. Um, and um, so the, and after they did that analysis of those two alternatives, they found that signalizing the intersection actually accomplished more goals and was cheaper to construct. But so you that, mentioned that the sidewalk was going to be down right. at the street level. So Are there is there not the same level of utilities underneath there? That's that's next. So that's that's like that that part of it. So the roadway. So the roadway is not being brought down. What is being brought down is the sideway sidewalk that exists today, 
up in this location. So Chris was talking about this sidewalk here, which doesn't follow the grade of the roadway. It's up higher, so it basically starts to climb and then climbs over a bunch of buckling trees and then goes down, back down further. Um, this particular location will be brought down, so the sidewalk will be brought down to the existing grade of the roadway as it is today, and there will be a retaining wall there. So that's what's being being changed. The roadway is not being And the owners of the down. condos there are being consulted about the ugliness of a retaining wall? <laughs> um, so the con oh this property so the retaining wall is, is in this location right here. The retaining wall doesn't extend towards this property here. It's it's behind um, the softball field. Okay. Okay. Um, I, you may have mentioned it. I'm sorry. You said we're at the 25 percent of design now. If we move ahead with this half a million dollars, does that get us to 70? Did you say 75 percent or the the final plans? The 450000 I don't know what just happened there. The $450,000 will allow us to finish the design plans to 100% design and plans that are ready to go out to bid for construction. That would be the end of the liability for the, to the town for planning purposes, correct? For design purposes. So this is the third, this is the third coming to town meeting to ask for money. You said the 13, 16, and now... 19. Is this it? So in 2013, that was for the initial concept and overall visioning for Kelly's Corner, which included an, a concept plan to define what the community wanted for infrastructure and streetscape. That was the 2013 funds. In 2016, the $756,000 was for the design for the concept that was defined at that time, which did not include Charter Road, did not include Community Lane, did not include some of those adjustments to the property owners, um, private properties, sorry. Um, and last town meeting, these two articles, or these two failed. requests um, failed at town meeting. Um, and we are back um, for, for this year um, with some significant changes to address the concerns that were expressed at town meeting. Um, so we feel that we've been able to address those concerns and we've been moving forward with the community and the property owners um, to really work on a plan that we feel is, is what the acting community is, um, is asking for. I'm just concerned about moving goalposts and whether or not there's, there's going to be a an acquisition in 19 and then another one in 22 and then another one in 25. So let me show you a little bit about where we are today in terms of mass DOT design planning. So we are, again, we're ready for that design public hearing. So previously, before town meeting last time, we had not gone through the mass DOT design review and we've already done that. We have a date set. Um, and we've made those changes that were to, um, to address the concerns at last town meeting. So we have a design plan now that is approved by MassDOT um, that we're ready to move forward with. Um, after this point here, you can kind of take a look at what items are remaining to finish the plan. There's permitting, there's refining landscaping, there's um, geotechnical design work finalizing those right-of-way plans. So there's a lot of work to be done still, but we're kind of out of that phase where you know your entire concept is going to change or large elements would be modified. Okay, and then the last question uh, is, you, you, on the previous slide you said that uh, it looks like the, the out to bid in late uh, 2021 and then Construction in 2022. That's is that when you're expecting the shovel to hit the pavement, or just for them to put us on the list? When do you anticipate uh, the shovel hitting the pavement? When and how many years do you expect this to go on for? So we are on the list um, for construction funds to start being paid out to a contra a contractor um, in federal fiscal year 2022. Um, in that December 25th, 2021 date, what is going to occur is that those, construct, those engineering plans that the town has created are going to be put out for our, uh, for, to out to bid um, by the state to select a contractor 
for the project. The state will be managing that entire process and really they take it over at that point for the town. Um, so the shovel will hit the ground in 2022. We expect the project to be um, probably around two to three years of construction. Thank you. Se construction seasons, I should say. Thank you, those are all the questions I have. Does anyone else have a follow-up? Dave. You know, I, I just want to say, I think we can all appreciate the work that's gone into this so far, but um, I want to echo the concerns just around the variance um, and estimates on the land taking cost. And it, it seems like clearly, as you've acknowledged, it's a giant number. And I, I'd request that you put a little bit of more, more color around that as far as like a town meeting would go, that they have some context around what is involved in that dollar price and then where the large variances are. And I understand that the last estimate you have is the, you know, the price per square foot from the Kmart appraisal and that's, that's something. I mean, as, as Jason, I think others were saying that it, it, it could really be any number and there's been much higher numbers I think that I've heard banter, bantered about in the past. So just to be fair to, fair to town meeting, it would be good if there was some more meat around that and even if there's uncertainty, just do your best at just sort of spelling that out. We don't know. This could be five million. It could be five hundred thousand. Hey, it's kind of a shot in the dark because um, that could be something that could be very material that the town would get blindsided by in a year or two out. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. I think that the um, our our principal assessor and assistant finance director, who's usually here uh, to add to your meetings, would say that appraisals is an art and not a science. And I think what we've done is estimate a number based on the science. And short of hiring, having the appraiser process do what they do, we can't estimate the art. So I think five million doesn't sound like a number we should be discussing. I think 500,000 uh, would be hard to get that low. I think 1.5 is a very reasonable thing to bring forward, which is uh, what we have before you tonight. Uh, I think that there are variables that will come into play, such as does a property owner want to donate their land? It could happen, it might not happen. Uh, are there other variables that we really can't uh, project or plan for? Uh, but I think that uh, if it comes in at 1.5, uh, or if it comes in at 1.8, the debt service for those two numbers are um, not that far off. And I think that uh, if we could go to town meeting and say, we can do this under our uh, Prop 2.5, if it is 1.5, we could do it if it's 1.8, uh, I think that the voters would, would want to know that. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll continue to work on refining that estimate. We actually did a competitive bidding process uh, to select appraisers, so they're, they're ready to go, uh, but they don't want to start working without uh, getting paid. Well, that's fair. I guess another way of, <laughs> I, I, another way I would ask the question is like, what's your confidence level around 1.5 million? Is it, we're 90% sure we're gonna be, you know, within a couple hundred thousand of that, or we're 40% sure? And I'm, I, I'm, I don't know what the answer is, and I, I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot about having an answer now, but if there is that amount of uncertainty, it would be good for the town to know that at, at a town meeting. And if there's not, that's great, too. I just I didn't hear it one way or the other tonight, in any case. Okay, we'll work on levels of, of confidence, but I feel that, you know, as I mentioned, with this being a debt service, and if it's between one and two million, the swing there is, um, I think it's like, uh, 100,000 to 160,000 in debt service. So I think that it's a good number to, to come in with and we'll try to tie some confidence levels to it. Yeah, just a suggestion, I mean, it's like I said, I, I'm, there's a lot of work that's gone into this and whatever makes it easier for the town to understand would be, I think, helpful. And to that end, make sure you know how many trees you're taking down because that, that bit us last year too. <coughs> Mr. Peterson. Thank you, John Peterson, Jackson Drive. Um, one of the things that's true um, for Community Way is it comes into Mass Abbott and Angle. It's a problem that exists throughout town. And as I looked at the design, it didn't look like too much effort had been made to try and square up Community uh, Way as it goes into Mass Abbott. I was wondering if you know people had looked at that and whether or not there was any opportunity to bring it in uh, a little bit more at right angles. I can mention it to our design engineers in MassDOT, but um, at this point they feel like that intersection um, is, is safe um, and that it meets all of the standards. Um, specifically, it's also, it's, it's signalized now, so today it's kind of a different story being, being um, at an angle and, and skewed with the alignment. 
but we'll, we'll, we'll mention that to our design engineers. Yeah, we got, I, it, it's very valuable because everybody who's, you know, come in at one of our many streets at angles like Concord, you know, if you don't bend so far anymore, it gets, it gets sort of tough. And then uh, you talked about the fact that um, Bueno Isano was one of the issues that had come up at town meeting, um, and I'm sure you've touched on other things, but are there three or four other things that you feel are significantly different today than were uh, as they were presented at town meeting? Yeah, so the, um, I mentioned briefly the Historical Society property, the Hosmer House. So previously there was going to be um, a few feet that were, be, that were required for the town to take. Um, and since town meeting, we have worked on several different alternatives with the Historical Society and have arrived at a design plan that shifts the roadway alignment of Main Street towards the other side um, off of their property. So we're able to stay within the town's right of way on that side of, of Main Street. So that was a pretty significant change. Anybody else? Thank you very much for your time, bringing, the, bringing everyone in and giving us this presentation. Okay. With that, we'll move on to uh, ALG feedback and guidance. And um, I, I do have some initial ranges for the capital projects costs. I'm going to lean on uh, Roland as well. Um, one of the uh, one of the proposals that was brought at ALG uh, was that the schools would uh, would use uh, another $150,000 from E and D to to uh, finish the the, def the deficit gap, but they did ask uh, if we would if we would move off of keeping $303,000 of unused tax levy, and so we did we did say that we would bring back to the Finance Committee with our recommendation that we, rather than having $303,000 unused tax levy capacity at the, end of, at the end of the year, we'd have 153,000 in unused tax levy capacity. So the schools kicked in $150,000 and the, the unused tax levy capacity is being tapped for another 153. And that, that would bring us into, into uh, a closed deficit for the for the coming year. Uh, got my numbers right, Roland? I'm showing 156. I'm showing 156. Yeah, you might be right. Uh, no, would you would lose, so we have we have 606,000 would use 456, leaving 150,000 of unused levy capacity. Leaving only 150,000. Okay, I got my which number we left. So. So yes, it's a case of bringing the, uh, rather than it being a 3.95 uh, increase for the single family tax, uh, rather than being able to bring it down to 3.6, it's gonna come in right around 3.78. Now, what swayed me on this is the fact that while the term, while the amount of money that, would, that we expected to, to actually not be necessarily be used, which would normally be turnbacks, the schools are trying to turn into a stabilization fund. So if anything that would have been over the 5% E&D would normally have had to be turned back to the towns, they're going to now try and target, and I'm, one of the questions I have for Budget Saturday from them is exactly what number are they trying to target for their E&D? During ALG, they said they mentioned 4.5. I'd like to actually see them put that down on paper somewhere, rather than rather than having it be right at five. They'd keep E and D at 4.5, and uh, they put uh, any uh, they put their excess otherwise excess turnbacks back into this new capital stabilization fund that uh, is being called out on uh, is probably being tapped in year three and four of the 12-year. Uh, capital improvement plan on the, on the, from the school district. So what the reason why I say I was swayed by this is it did dump the town manager. The, the free cash for the town is going to be going down more so than would normally have happened if we, if we were able to get normal turnbacks because the school is using, is going to hold their erstwhile turnbacks in the form of the stabilization fund for capital plans. And so we didn't want to bring back, bring down free cash 
too rapidly, so that's that's why I was swayed by it. I don't know if Roland would like to weigh in as to why he was willing to, to sign on board, but this is the this is the proposal that I'm bringing back to the committee. Do you want to weigh in before we ask uh, Steve his? I, I think you summarize that just fine. Just I just feel it's you know it's also a compromise. The schools are kicking an extra hundred fifty thousand. We kick in a little more. It works out. We still, did notice we the still, town didn't kick in any extra at the end, but that's okay. We still have time to work with them on that. Um, I, it's, it is, we still have some unused levy capacity to use in the future. Yeah. That's kind of where I, I fell. It says we're not going to use it all, which is what they wanted to originally do. And Jason and I both said that meeting, no way. And I think this way it's, it's a compromise like anything else. Worried about having the reserves be too low. Steve, w w would you like to weigh in? No, I want to go through the math. Okay. Um, when last we talked, <laughs> Um, we were looking at an ALG plan from January 3rd that had a $761,000 deficit. And last time we talked about school adjustments, cutting out 203 of that, yep. and overlay, uh, cutting out 150. Yep. So you just mentioned another 150 in school E&D? Correct. And what else? Uh, uh, in the, the numbers that you have in front of you, they were using all 606,000 of. Correct. And so we are clawing back 150,000 to hold in, in unused tax levy capacity. So how do we close the deficit then? So we, at the start of the last ALG meeting, we'd have $303,000 deficit, including the use of all of the let me get this straight. The, <laughs> including the use of all of the unused tax levy capacity. So then, oh, uh, so, oh, okay. And the other thing that the other thing that you need to remember is that in that number we had 1.3 million uh, use in reserves. So we're allowing the use reserves to come up to 1.7. Okay. That's that's where the last that's where the last bit is. Right. Thank you. Yeah, the, the user reserve comes up to one seven, as opposed to going up to two, up to two million, which is what I had presented to the finance committee at the last meeting. Does that make sense now, Steve? Okay, now it makes sense. Good. I'm glad I didn't forget forget stuff entirely. Um, uh, I know that the we went around the room uh, at the last the finance committee meeting. Everybody said that they prefer to keep three hundred and three in unused tax levy capacity, but there were two people who noted they were worried about the reserves starting to run skinny. Um, Roland and I did say that we bring this back and recommend this. Uh, how, uh, how? What's the sense of the committee as now that we've now that we've laid out or what we're looking at? We'll go this way this time, Tom. Uh, Jason, Mr. Chairman, I'm in favor of this. I think it's a good compromise. I think the impact on the, the tax bill, if my simple math is right, it's twenty dollars yep. to an average household. So, yep. I think uh, in the spirit. Of closing this, I think it's a good, good solution. Thank you. Anybody else care to weigh in, or are we going to call this good? Dave, you're good. Christine, you're good. Mike, yeah. Steve, um, seems reasonable enough. Um, where are we on the other two years? That's where it got fun. <laughs> so they did. They did put the two out years on the on the sheet, and I believe I did forward that ALG sheet to the entire committee prior to, actually prior to ALG. The thing that came out in the meeting that I was clearly not happy about, and I believe I voiced it properly, um, and and actually I'm going to I'm gonna jump forward, jump, I'm going to go right back to your question, but I'm going to jump forward to the initial ranges for capital projects, because that is the number one feeder into the out years. The number that was used by the uh, town manager for the cost of a proposed North Acton fire station is now 9.5 million. So it's gone up 2 million in the last year. Um, now he did say that he was trying to be conservative. I thought he was padding it a little much. But uh, yes, yeah, so the, when they went out for design funding last year, they were projecting 7.5 million and now they're saying 9.5 million. So that's a fun number. Um, now, the school number, and I'm going to catch hell 
for, uh, for saying this number, even though it was part of a public meeting at the school building committee last week. Um, we are at the point where we, have to, where we have recommended building a new consolidated school on the Gates site. The only thing left to fight about is whether we do this in a single phase or if we do it in two phases. Uh, the single phase option, just by way of quick background information, would require shaving off four classrooms from the current Gates facility, but would allow us to build it in, in less time, half the time. Um, the two numbers, and these numbers are early numbers and should be treated as part of a range um, and should not be treated as gospel. Uh, the single phase with uh, a 30% guesstimate for soft costs comes in at 135 million and the two year, the two phase project comes in at 138 and a half million. Furthermore, the representative from Skanska said that we should not take, we should, we should put a, a guesstimate bogey on our MSBA reimbursement and subtract 10% because nobody ever actually gets the full reimbursement. Uh, one of the number one reasons for that is that the site costs are capped at 8% of the total cost and everybody overruns the 8% site preparation costs. If you do the numbers on this, take the, take the phase one number of 135 million and assume we're only going to get 35.3% back. That's a, an almost $80 million nugget to be handled by Acton and Boxborough. If you want to take the 80 million and lop 15% off of it, that's the Acton share. These are very large numbers. We're going to have to make sure to do ranges. I am hoping, and this is this is me being candid and saying I'm hoping, I'm hoping that these numbers are the worst case scenario numbers. Uh, and I've been cautioned that we're going to get much, much closer numbers as we get to the special town meeting in November, uh, where we should actually, so that the actual massaging of the numbers by Skanska is going to occur over the summer in the July time frame. But this is the first number that's been put down on paper and presented at a public meeting, so I wanted to bring it to back to the committee. So here's where it got ugly at ALG. Since long-term borrowing is not going to occur in either of the next two years, both entities chose to put nothing into their plans, which I politely referred to as completely disingenuous and begged them to reconsider. And since it is our responsibility to put out the long range plan anyway, I will move forward with my own version of this, which I'll bring to everybody. I will ask both uh, Steve and Dave, Steve Bartlett and Dave Ertolino, for what their best guesstimate of what the short term uh, costs are gonna be during those two years. But to have put nothing in that, to have put nothing in for short term borrowing costs and not be reflecting these projects at all in the two out years, I thought was outrageous. Was I clear enough at, during the ALG meeting there, Mr. Gordon? I think so. Gordon? I think we were. Um, it's something we get it, you know, we gotta know. When do we anticipate the long term borrowing taking place? So the long-term borrowing, to, to the best of my understanding on the school side, would actually occur in 23, which is one, one year out from our two year, from our further two projection. True, but it's the middle of our FinCom five-year model, and I recently went through and started updating that. So um, we're going to... There's no information. We're going to have to make some assumptions. Well, and that's why I'm taking the assumption of 135 with a 35.3 reimbursement rate after the additional soft costs. I'm going to, I'm going to ding act in for 85 percent and assume that the population population mix between Acton and Boxborough or student enrollment mix between Acton and Boxborough isn't going to change that much in the three years. Uh, and the, those are the numbers I'm going to use when I have to present a five-year plan. Okay not going to be a pretty number. It's not. Dave? 
And that <clears throat> that's fiscal 23. Fiscal 23. And so what, when would the schools in the first phase and second phase be completed? So they are, they are planning on first phase being completed. If it's a one phase project, the whole thing would be completed and ready to be occupied you know, for September of 2022. And if it's a two phase plan, uh, the, the first building, which would be the Gates School relocated, uh, would be ready in September of 2022. And the Douglas School would be vacated and moved into the new finished building September of 2023. So, is there so if it's a if it's a one phase, the long term borrowing would be in fiscal 2023. If it's a two phase, uh, it wouldn't be until fiscal 2024 because you can't take out the long term note until the project is finished. Oh, is that right? So how do how they, they fund it in the interim? Uh, they call bands. Bonds. Bands. Okay. Yeah. Bands. Short term borrowing bands. Sure. Why not? So one thing that confused me is, you know, when we looked at the Miniman bond, Miniman clearly did a long-term borrowing prior to project completion. Um, but, you know, as you just stated, and as Marie clearly stated during ALG, um, there's going to be a short-term borrowing. So why is it that Miniman could do a long-term borrowing, but we don't have any opportunity to do that if we would conclude that that was financially appropriate? I don't know. I was just told that we cannot do a long-term, we cannot do a long-term bond until the projects are complete. Yeah. So the, the minimum bond clearly they've got a long-term bond out prior to project completion. So the, it would seem to me that that should be investigated to be, to see if there are options. Do you have any information on that? Well, I can't answer it 100 percent, but you have to remember, re, uh, Minuteman is a regional school Sorry. system, so they're borrowing uh, power consisted of. Uh, nine to 11 different communities. So I think they were looked at more favorably uh, in that regard. Also, with regard to the budget here, the construction budget, Scanzia is, Scanza is a awesome architect and they come up with a terrific plan. But uh, as in the case of Minuteman, uh, we brought in a professional project manager team, Gilbane, uh, out of Providence, and you know they were able to take that 36-month construction schedule, and uh, just by uh, looking at uh, construction practices, um, when things are delivered, uh, you know how things are fabricated on site or off site, uh, looking at the list of materials that's used, they were able to subtract uh, 12 months of the 36 month schedule to make it a you know do everything in in uh, <clears throat> 24 months also that meant a significant out of a 144.9 million dollar project it's estimated that uh, 12 months of construction cost a uh, construction cost yeah that savings itself would could equal as much as 10 to 12 million dollars just just through being more efficient uh, in your practices uh, and substituting, you know, one material for another, and still meet your objectives. And uh, so, I think there are opportunities to keep that to get that number down a bit once the design is sort of committed. So, like I said, I hope this was a worst case, you know bring in the highest number you possibly can at the beginning and try and, and try and go from there. Uh, what I'm not happy about is that the first time around this, the, the, the first swag eight months or so ago was down in the 120s. So don't like the direction, but we'll see. We'll see. Yes. If they go with a, uh, two questions around this. If they go with a two phase construction, does that um, change when the MSBA reimbursement starts? Uh, no, the MSBA reimbursement actually starts starts to be con starts to be ongoing and rolling. So we don't actually have to wait for the project to be completed to get our reimbursement. So that's good news. So that, and I was worried about that as well. Uh, starting uh, at some sometime relatively soon, actually, uh, the the payments 
payments do come, come back to the school district. So there, it's also important to remember that there's two separate reimbursement rates. There's a reimbursement rate during the feasibility time, which is fixed at 45.3, and they're, they're gonna start paying us now for the money that we've already uh, laid out uh, during the, during the um, feasibility phase. Then there will be a separate number, which will be a known number at the time, by the time we get to November, um, and and that's the that's the reimbursement rate where they'll be paying back again, paying against as uh, as expenditures are made during the building during the construction phase. Okay, my other question was why we're putting gates in first, given that Douglas is the reason that we're doing the whole project. Why would gates be moving in a year earlier? Because you have to move them out before you can knock down the old building to build the new building to build the new wing. Ah, gotcha. Thank you. Selectman Benson. Yes, Jason. Um, with respect to the phase one and phase two construction and the shaving of four classrooms at Gates, what is, exactly does that mean? So it means that during the time of construction, the four, four or so classrooms would either have to be in a modular or would have to be somewhere else in the building uh, until so to allow for the footing of the new of the new building. Uh, I see, but the four classrooms that would be temporary modules would be incorporated in the in the final construction. Yes, so it would be, it's all about trying to make sure that there is a landing zone for the, okay. for the, the first of the consolidated schools within all the uh, constraints and boundaries of the, of the stream that runs through that and all of the uh, wetlands involved and et cetera. Yeah, that, that, that's fair enough because the, the reason why I asked the question is we've had a history when we've built schools to save money by making them smaller. The, when Gates, Douglas, and Conant were built in the early 70s, Douglas was the third school to be built. And they said, well, we'll save some money and we'll make it a two-section school. And we quickly no, paid no. the cost the, for that. The, the purpose of this consolidated, the, the, the plan for this consolidated school is to have three sections per grade per school, period. Perfect. Uh, the only the only argument that I see on the horizon is whether or not we're going to include the pre-K part, uh, the pre-K classrooms in this or not, or if we're going to pull that out in an attempt to minimize square footage and lower costs. I still think that's a bad idea because then you have to uh, then you still have to deal with the administration building. But that's I don't want to get into that. I don't want to be deliberating on in public on on that. Too late. Christy? Uh, if we do um, use modular classrooms for um, the sections and gates, would that be part of this general budget, or does that come of some, out of somewhere else? Is that part of the building budget? It would come out of the building budget. And yes, it would be truly temporary and will be flattened when the, uh, when the old school, school comes down. OK. Any other comments on the ALG feedback and the long range initial, the initial ranges for the capital projects? Okay. Is it quick? I, I just want to say that with respect to the building project, you know, I've seen there are a whole bunch of schools that are, you know, queued up ahead of us. And so from my view, it would be fantastic if the FinCom would assign somebody to follow two or three of those projects along so that what happens with those projects in terms of the bonding strategy, bonding rates and everything comes into this process as a comparator. Thank you. No, they said they were fine with it. Okay, we'll move on to uh, the next uh, item on the agenda. Do we have any minutes to, uh, to go over? Very good. Uh, I'm gonna take these out of order if uh, no one minds. Point of view outreach, I did see Sahana, you sent out a message earlier today. I'll be there on Thursday for the, for the first of the kickoff. It's here? Okay, very good. Um, are you missing any, t are you missing any time slots now? Do you need, do you need any volunteers or are you good to go? So
So um, they cannot get us into one of their meetings, and uh, Deanne was very specific. She said they have only five meetings per year, and the attendance is very low at these meetings. And she wanted to see if we can give her the document, and she would pass that around on March in on her March 13th meeting. Absolutely. Okay, so I'll send it over to her. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, was that the only one that uh, we were unable to book? Um, I'm still waiting to hear from Miriam and uh, from um, the Rotary. Okay. Christine. Do we want to just do a quick videotape of our first presentation, and then we can have that available for this sort of instance? I like the idea of people being present to answer questions. Sure, but if we're going to give them just the document with no verbiage at all, isn't a video? Is it just that you don't want to be on video? That's why you did the. Uh, that's why you did the the, the get to know your, your 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 act, yeah the action TV spot. I, I actually liked it. It was great. You can have some pretend people ask questions. There you go. Um, well, we're definitely not going to be able to record it on Thursday. This coming Thursday. Why? Yeah. I mean, we can just set up a. Yeah. We'll pick the second one. The one I'm not going to. All right. Okay. Can, okay. I mean, we can try asking Act and TV if they can be available on Thursday, but it's a short notice. We'll ask. We'll ask. Okay. okay. Uh, community reports. Let's go around the table. Uh, Tom. Christy. Roland. I do. I was at CPC last week. Uh, there's a project for Jones Field that's coming through. Uh, looks like about $269,000. There's several phases. There's a phase one of 309, 530. The second phase of 310,000. They're looking at, uh, they're asking for CPC, I believe, for 269,000. There is. Action Arboretum ADA compliant entrance. Um, they're asking for fifty five thousand dollars. The total project cost around sixty thousand to make that ADA compliant. And the other one was a China Trail. They're asking for fifteen thousand. There's a lot of leverage there with uh, people from the Chinese community. And to me, it was an architect, uh, landscape architect, Vaughn, doing work with that and donation of trees, etc. Or plants, so, um, along the ends. When they do these projects at the Aberdeen, they've been removing invasive species along along those as well. Whenever they do an enhancement, which is great. Um, this week, on uh, this Thursday, they are t discussing the Ace of Parliament House out here with our town manager, who is not here right now. He slipped um, out. Yes, um, and Steve Noon and I. Both said on budget Saturday that a bulldozer is probably the best thing for that building. But anyway, um, there's another one of the window preservation projects. Which I have no idea what their what that entails. And then there's another meeting. There's another one presenting on Thursday for 53 River Street to do a historic park on the River Street fraud, on the River Street parcel. So we'll see what those entail. But um, How's it? Thank you. Sahana, Steve, Dave, how's sewers going? Christine? Um, so uh, I wasn't able to attend the last school committee meeting, but I was watching it on video. Um, and Mary Brolin is not going to run again. Um, and then they hit, asked some others. Eileen is not sure yet. And Diane mentioned that there would be two open spots, but I'm not sure who the other one besides Mary is. Um, they did a study of the new busing, now that we've gone to two-tier busing, and um, basically determined that they're pretty close to all of their ideal numbers for getting kids to school on time, and that the, um, the, the, the fix for a couple of instances where buses hit three, hit Conant, McCarthy Town, and, and Merriam, um, were, they were getting some kids to school late. Um, and so that is the why. The budget includes two new buses. They originally thought three, but the study revealed that they really can't get any more efficacy out of that third one. Um, uh, and the other thing that they looked at was a possibility of um, changing to all-day kindergarten throughout the district. 
Um, this is not something that they have really studied yet. Um, the number that was floated was about 1.2 million. Um, so it, it, the committee is going to decide whether or not they want to even start the process of doing a one-year review to see if that's possible. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, Minuteman, uh, we met the, this earlier this evening. Uh, it's on schedule, under budget. We've uh, spent 57% <coughs> of our budget, and 94.6% uh, you know, is is now committed. Um, it's looking good. As a matter of fact, next month's meeting will probably be held inside the the new facility uh, somewhere. And we still would like to invite the uh, Acton Boxborough School Building Committee and the uh, Acton uh, School Board if they would like to tour the Minuteman to see what it's like and what's going on. Uh, <coughs> I think they would uh, enjoy the tour. Uh, with regard to Main Street, the Walker property, uh, at the public forum and then uh, the vote uh, last week, we did select the uh, 31 senior housing 40B project uh, and possible dog park. We'll present, be presenting that proposal to uh, the Board of Selectmen, I believe, next week. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, just want to report on the Mass Municipal Association's annual meeting. Um, you people as finance committee members are all welcome to attend. I don't know if, did you get invitations this year? No. Um, all right, we'll have to straighten that out because it's, a, it's many worthwhile programs and finance committee members from other, other towns attend. Um, uh, at the meeting of the, uh, it was Saturday morning at the Selectmen's Association, we had a panel um, that included the Chelsea School Superintendent, and that's a, a school system that its population is 86% immigrant kids um, with a tremendous amount of special needs to be met and the struggle that the superintendent is having um, keeping that all going and the way she's been doing it is cutting teachers to save on salaries and increasing class size to over 32 per class and then we heard from a selectman who lives in the tritown school district that's up in northeastern massachusetts i believe it's rowley and georgetown in one other city and the struggles they're having at keeping it all going and that's all in context with the state department of education wanting to reconfigure really for the second time since 1993 when Ed reform went in what would be the formula for school reimbursement and school aid one selectman i don't know which town was talking about, made a very practical and impassioned suggestion. He said, look, instead of trying to rejigger the formula, it's just going to set either cities against small towns and small towns against cities. Why doesn't the state think big and take over the entirety of the cost of special education? You've made this a mandate, now back it up with your money. <laughs> and that got a resounding um, round of applause. So in, in thinking about it, it should go into budget, uh, budget Saturday on the school side this week. I think that's something um, you should talk about. I was going to see Diane Baum on Friday morning and mention this development to her. And also, um, towns were struggling with an increasing senior population and how to balance those needs with the continuing needs of the school side without creating a lot of conflict within the school. So that's, those were my big uh, takeaways from the weekend. Uh, I just want to follow up with Mike, uh, without shooting the messenger, Mike, how much of the $1.8 million that we paid for the Walker property will we recoup from this proposal? Uh, $1 million, half of which comes from CPC. All right, so nothing then. <laughs> Correct. 
Well, I'll get on my soapbox one more time and say, when we go before the town meeting and say we're going to buy this piece of land and we don't know what we're going to do with it, it's a big mistake. We're misleading the public. No, I, I, um, just to uh, give you the uh, full lay on that, um, with the uh, competing project of, of now, uh, now Communities, they would build, I think it was 15 homes, Mike? 15 small? 15, 15 16, something like that. Uh, small homes. Um, they would pay $1.8 million for it if they were all market rate homes. If they made two of those homes affordable, they would pay $1.1 million to us. So that's about $100,000 off. And on the CPC monies, um, those monies are tax, as you know, that revenue is derived separately from strict property it's tax. Still tax money it's, from the it's still tax money. It's a surcharge. It's, 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 it's a surcharge. It's a surcharge. It, it goes to the CP, there's CPA. A, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit of state match in there, but not much anymore. Yeah. So. It, no, it, we, maybe we got 10% of the $1.8 million back. It's bad policy, that's all. Yeah, the other thing that now communities would have uh, generated uh, about $200,000 a year in income, uh, real estate taxes as well, which we also lose out on. Once we have the warrant articles in hand, we will get to decide, get to vote on those uh, in preparation for the for the preparation for the town meeting. Did I miss any other uh, any of the other committees? Uh, I have not actually sent my questions in for school budget Saturday yet, even though only two of you have sent in questions to me. Thank you very much to the two of you that sent it. You know who you are. Uh, if you have, if anybody else has questions for the school budget Saturday, please try and get it to me uh, sometime tomorrow so that I can. Give them at least two days to respond. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> You're always ready. <laughs>